you may not see anything, although uh, it, it's the pressure gradient uh, more than the density gradient uh, that matters. There's still a temperature pedestal in high mode. Um, so, but that's sort of what we are thinking um, in terms of why we don't see a density response uh, in L mode. Another uh, possibility is uh, there's no drift wave at all, let's say, and you're just uh, pushing the flux surface in and out, and uh, this uh, B dot grad N uh, is then uh, giving you uh, the density fluctuation, and you know when grad N is bigger, the density fluctuation is bigger. So that's sort of a, 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 an opposing uh, idea uh, as well. So you're probably taking advantage of some latent uh, resonance, yeah. which will give you a lot more response. Right. If there's an uh, incipient mode, right. then you would if there's no incipient mode. Yeah. To, to just follow up on that, I mean, you still say that the natural condition is some drift wave. Um, so when the, when the frequency is off QCM, then you think there could still be some place in the plasma where you're still going to get a drift wave, which is mad. Right. So why, do why we does it not mean you know? Yeah, so, so <coughs> this is sort of the question of why is there a QCM as well at a particular uh, wave, if it's a drift wave? What's picking out? Uh, the particular wave number and frequency of the QCM. So uh, what, what we've sort of talked about, um, if, if you look at the, the, the scanning mirror Langmuir probe data, you can get this uh, very nice profiles of uh, the E cross B velocity, which is how the, the whole plasma sort of rotates in a perpendicular direction, as well as the uh, electron diamagnetic drift velocity. And there's a little region right at the last post flux surface, the boundary between open and closed field lines, um, where that the shear in the, the total uh, uh, velocity, the sum of E cross B and electron diamagnetic uh, drift velocities goes to zero. So you get this stationary uh, uh, little bands, you know, a few millimeters wide, where the shear, uh, where the, the drift velocities are essentially constant. Um, and this happens to, to be the band where the QCM lives. It gives you a, a narrow uh, uh, radial range. Uh, about three millimeters wide, in which uh, the QCM survives. And we can conjecture, okay, so shear is first of all the thing that, that picks out where the QCM can live, where there's a lot of shear, where you know between adjacent uh, uh, flux layers, between adjacent surfaces, uh, the plasma is moving faster on one surface than another, and it rips apart the mode. But in this little narrow window, the shear goes away and the mode can survive. Uh, and that narrow radial extent is then uh, confining what the perpendicular wave number has to be as well. And then uh, through the drift wave dispersion relation, we get a frequency uh, from this also. So that's one possibility for what the QCM is doing. And then we can say the antenna as well uh, has the same behavior. And so it also has a single resonance uh, rather than many resonances. Um, and that's again determined by uh, this uh, stationary layer of drip velocities. So that's uh, the, the going theory. Um, but you know, it, again, it would be nice to, to have these additional measurements. Uh, then we can be less eloquent and more uh, boring data, but accurate. OK. So both of the others. So you, you, if I understand you right, you, <coughs> the way you're speaking, is that when you energize the antenna, you have magnetic perturbations. If you can detect elsewhere in the, in the torus, and and yet you don't see density perturbations, and you suggested that one reason, or you suggested several possible reasons why that might be the case. Uh, one of which is that you've got a lower density gradient, so moving the field sideways just just makes it smaller. I mean, have you looked? quantitatively at that question about whether the level of suppression of the density fluctuation signal is or is not consistent with the change that is due to changes in density gradients, for example? Uh, you know, I, I don't think so. I mean, one thing um, we can sort of uh, think about now is how much is the, the magnetic field perturbation? You know, and if you extrapolate to the last close flux surface, it's going to be on the order of the Gauss. Um, so you expect the, the, the flux surfaces to be perturbed by a very small amount. 
But you're right, this is something that you can calculate. But we can measure it as well. But the, the other question, the follow-up question is, how big is the, is the field perturbation? And as, is it actually observed to be bigger in the cases where you're resonating with a QCM than it is in the case, cases where you are not? Yes, uh, it's substantially bigger. Um, so so uh, let's take a look. Uh, the field perturbation is all right, so this is it. Uh, this is sort of uh, our estimate of trying to pull out uh, what the size of the coherent fluctuation is. And it, it's a little bit hard to do that uh, because you have this intrinsic mode, uh, or at least part of the discharge in the background. But the way that I'm doing this is I'm scaling the transfer function by the antenna current. And that's this blue line here. So this is the response we get in L mode. And then this is what we get in H mode. And here is where we cross the QCM frequency. So we get, you know, uh, Oh, not quite an order of magnitude, but well, actually close to an order of magnitude uh, increase uh, around the peaks. I guess maybe Ian, Ian, you were talking about magnetic flutter, perhaps, and maybe you need B yeah. radio, a B radio perturbation to do that. Yeah, there yeah. should also be a B radio uh, fluctuation on the same scale as the pull over field as well. Another question that um, yeah, at least in the back. It almost looks to me as if you're driving the complex conjugate of the QCM. If you're driving a damp load at the same frequency, uh, and you have to think about the wave. I think there might be a contradiction with the wave numbers, with the wave vectors, though, because uh, they would have to be, you have to have the opposite wave vector to make it add to zero, and you, uh, you see in the electron direction. So. Uh, yeah, so you mean the difference between the laboratory frame and the plasma frame here? That's, I'm confused about that. Yeah, so uh, this is a, a point that uh, I didn't talk about much uh, uh, before. But it, it's related to the uncertainty in the, in the radial location of the driven mode, okay? So uh, if the mode lives in the layer where the QCM <laughs> lives, uh, then the E cross B uh, drift is in the opposite direction as the electron dynamic drift. When you uh, uh, reverse the Doppler shift, so you're looking in the plasma frame, you're still going to get both the, the QCM mode and in this case also the, uh, the driven mode, which propagate in the lab frame in the electron diamond direction, also in the plasma frame in the electron diamond direction. Um, if the mode lives further in, uh, then the E cross B uh, drift changes direction, and then, yeah, you do get in the plasma frame uh, uh, propagation in one direction and in the laboratory frame the opposite. And that's why it's important to try to measure this radial location. Um, and, but yeah, it, it turns out for the QCM, um, and, and this is a really a sticky feature, because the, the radial resolution that you need um, to, to pull out which direction the E cross B e, uh, velocity is in is under five millimeters. Um, and you know, the E cross, the, the e fit reconstruction, the equilibrium field reconstruction, you know, it, it's remarkably accurate, and hats off to, to Bob Granitz uh, for that, um, but not quite to within five millimeters. So mapping errors from EFIT can tell you the complete opposite picture, right? You think the mode is in a different location than it is actually. Uh, and that's the difference between, you know, going forward and, and backwards. So, you know, for a space rocket, right, this is the difference between going to the moon and, and having a trial on public uh, TV. So, uh, you know, in our case, of course, it's the difference between, for example, a drift wave and a, and a ballooning mode. Um, and then there are questions of, well, maybe the mode is, is not just in this one location, but it's part of a bigger system over a wider radial extent, with different physics further up the pedestal and down the pedestal. Um, and, and, you know, this may get at this question of why is there a damped resonance? Uh, when the QCM is going, which is the, the point that you had made earlier, maybe we're driving the conjugate of the QCM, or maybe we're driving part of the QCM system, um, and further up the pedestal there's something ballooning-like, um, and by merit of this rapidly varying E cross B velocity, uh, these modes can couple. Um, the, the, the E cross B shear makes it possible for the phase velocities to align. That's, you know, but again, this is conjecture. It would be much better to, to just stick the probe in get a measurement. Yeah. So you're on oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the shoeless antenna currently is where you would measure the largest fluctuations of the QCM or, or all of these modes, right? On the, the floor location right at the outboard midplane. 
but do you think with the, the view of trying to control or drive these modes, would there be merits to perhaps being politically offset or even, I mean, shooting towards the high field you know, side? Yes, so this is in the last chapter of my thesis, so very good. Yeah, um, this is an interesting question, and it would be certainly giving interesting physics information, right? The drift wave is, is not, uh, you know, per se associated with this ballooning uh, uh, feature, right? Um, you know, it, it's not uh, curvature driven, it's uh, driven by, uh, well, resistively unstable. So you ought to be able to drive it on the outboard side or the inboard side. And so this also asks the question for the QCM, why is the QCM ballooning light, even though we know it has uh, this uh, drift wave features, um, at least lower in the, in the pedestal, why doesn't it go around uh, the whole uh, cross section? Um, and you know, maybe there's more than one part to the QCM. Maybe you can drive the drift wave and not the rest, if, if, if that makes any sense. If you move the antenna, uh, displace it poloidally and put it, say, on the top or even on the high field side, and maybe still coax uh, particles out of the plasma there, and wouldn't that be nice? Now you're not getting killed as much um, by this, this heat flux. So that would be uh, something to think about, and it would also tell us What's the plasma response on the high field side? Do you still get these kinds of resonances or not? Um, so when we build ADX, we can put in, in addition to lower hybrid ICRF, uh, shoelace antenna on the high field side. Oh, geez, I can't help. Mark, yeah, yeah, so you, you, you talked about mode coupling, and so that raises a question. Uh, I mean, I think you know that there's a curiosity that we've seen for years that, that at the same time we see the QC mode, we often see very high frequency. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember seeing that. That, that, that are in a frequency range hundreds of kilohertz that we associate with outband activity. Have you ever looked in that frequency range to see whether... So, um, you know, we had one, once upon a time, um, had done some ICRF amplitude modulation experiments trying to hit uh, that frequency range. Um, I don't remember if those particular discharges were L, I think they were L mode in fact, uh, not EDA. They were in the same band uh, frequency range. Um, but those, I mean, there's a couple of reasons why that will have a hard time coupling with these modes. You know, the, the, the wave number probably doesn't match. You're down on many road. Um, relation, so you can get a, at least if it's three-way coupling, uh, pretty uh, big attenuation because of the difference in frequencies, which is sort of a factor of 100. Um, and on top of that, uh, well, we, this antenna can't hit that frequency range, and it also doesn't have the right perpendicular wave number. But it is kind of an interesting question, you know, What's the relationship between these modes? Um, and, you know, another thing is that they could be aliased from an even higher frequency. Um, and that would start to get at the, the eigenmodes from this drift system, um, you know, which are a little over a megahertz. Um, so they may be aliased down under the, the Nyquist frequency and don't really have a big, I mean, another feature of those modes is we usually only pick them up on the mirno coils, not on the density. Uh, which is also, you know, what you would expect more for Albanian. Although, you know, you can get pressure disturbances in, in say, you know, the drip loaded model from these uh, uh, Albanian waves. But yeah, that would be an interesting thing and, and maybe try to tie into this relationship between, you know, if it exists between these drip waves and uh, Albanian activity as well. So yeah, that, that would be a, a, a good activity. To Certainly, you know, one, one, sorry, we can, you know, look at, at the mode numbers between those two. I, I don't think they, they align uh, precisely, but I can go back and look in a lot of them, um, you know, and see if at least there's some chance of the beta velocities matching. Um, we also, you know, I, I wonder where those Albanian waves are localized. Right, yeah. that's the mystery. Of course, yeah. we can only look at them outside. Unless we poke, yeah, we can try to conjure them up and poke at them with the mirror language. Okay, are there any more questions, discussion? Okay, well thanks again, Ted.